A few years ago, my granddaughter Zoe was making some invitations for a pool party, and she's great at designing, so she's really making them very pretty. But I glanced at what she wrote about the pool, and she said that it was heated, but she spelled heated H-E-E-T-E-D. So I said, Zoe, heated is spelled H-E-A-T-E-D. And she rolled her eyes at me, and she said, Grandma, it's not the invitation that's going out. I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to say. And, and, I, and she goes, it doesn't matter, Grandma. And I said, yes, it does, Zoe. And I said, everything you put into your brain matters. If you put it in wrong, you're going to remember it wrong. If you spell it right, you will remember it right. Now, I believe that, and because I believe that, I try to be very careful of what I put in here because you and I know that once it goes in here, it's really hard to scrub out or get rid of. I think our memory has what, what I call ruts, and we file our experiences into those ruts. And sometimes that, that self-rut, that self-protect rut, that I'm a failure rut, all of those kind of thoughts rut, get really, really wide. And then the I'm a child of God rut is, is really small. And what I find happens is the experience comes into our life and we've got this skinny I'm a child of God rut, we've got a fat I'm a failure rut, and, and things get put in here. And we've got to expand this by feeding it with praising God, by feeding it with the what's good and lovely, as Philippians 4, 8 says, by feeding it truth. So it gets fatter and fatter. And this one we starve. You know, this is where we take our thoughts captive and deny our thoughts so it gets skinnier and stinnier. And then when the circumstance happens, falls into that fat rut, and that's what we want, the rut that God has for us. What we do with the things in our life will determine the battle that goes on in our minds. You see, we can't change our hearts. They're kind of stuck with being deceitfully wicked until we go home to be with Jesus, at least as far as our ability to change them. God changes hearts, doesn't he? But our minds, see, our minds, we get to change. God does what we can't do. He won't change our mind because that's our part. And see, our part, we won't change our minds unless we believe that the thoughts and the truth that God gives us are true. We'll stay with the old kind of thinking. So God provides the tools and the power and we discover that as we change our minds, God changes our hearts. It's important to recognize that's where the battle is. It's not in the body as much as our bodies can trouble us. It's not in the heart as much as our hearts can deceive us. It's not with life as much as circumstances can affect us. It's not even with other people. Our problem is not with our husbands or our parents or children co-workers or friends, as much as they can hurt us or disappoint us or even fail us, battles in the mind. And although our minds are flesh, we can't fight, as we just read, the, the battles with our flesh. For the source of our battles that we fight is spiritual. The source is powers and principalities much stronger than you and I could ever be. So right off, we've got to decide and understand that to win, we've got to fight them, these battles, with our spiritual weapons. Weapons of the flesh do not work. See, do you believe that? Just in case you don't, I want to go over some of the weapons of the flesh that our thinking and the world has provided for us. Even before that, we've got to consider some of the battles we fight in our minds. Here's some of them. Worry. Guilt, fear, discouragement, inadequacies, depression, anger, all battles in the mind. And there are more, but hopefully you'll see as we move on that no matter the battle, 
The answers are very similar, at least when you fight with spiritual weapons. Not so much with fighting with weapons of the flesh. Now, what are the weapons of the flesh? Basically, the weapons of the flesh fall into three categories. Look into our own power, look into our own reasoning, and look into our feelings. The Word of God tells us that neither of those work. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, notice this word Lord of hosts up there uh, is Jehovah Sabbath. In other words, he's the Lord of hosts. He is the one who has power over all powers and all principalities. So God says it's not in the flesh. It's by his spirit. And his spirit has power over all powers and all principalities. That's a mighty weapon. So if you find yourself thinking thoughts of worry, what are some of the fleshly weapons? What are those things that people tell you to tell yourself when you're worrying? Maybe it's consider the odds. Statistics say that 97% of the things that we worry about don't happen. That's all you got to do. But see, some of you have experienced the 3%, haven't you? You've been in that 3% and you sit there and think, that's nice, but I know bad things happen. So it doesn't work. You say it'll all work out fine. It usually does. But you've been the brunt of some pretty painful stuff. You know, you know there are times when bad things do happen. And then we're told, remember the phrase, don't worry, be happy? Oh, thanks. That really helps. <laughs> or, or guilt, you know. Someone will come up to you and they want to lighten the guilt, so they say, it's not your fault. Anybody would have done what you did. You were provoked. It's not really that bad. Yet you have this conscience that knows what you did was wrong and you don't know how to deal with it and the weapons of the flesh don't help. You know you're guilty and you just can't put it away like that. Or fear, again, probably won't happen. Think positive thoughts. Buckle up, pull up your bootstraps, face your fears. Look them straight in the eye. And you try, but your fears kind of look straight back at you. It doesn't help. Inadequacies. You can do it. Look in the mirror and tell yourself, you're beautiful. You're smart. Read some self-help books. Speak positive messages to yourself. But nothing helps to block out the messages of the past that shout out at you. Failure. Worthless. Unlovable. Depression. Again, think happy thoughts. Deny the sad thoughts. Get out more. Find a hobby. Anger. Stuff it. No, express it. Hit something. Exercise. And you know, see, some of this works for a while, a little bit. But fleshy weapons don't heal. Now, I'm not sure that I can say that all worry and guilt and fear come from evil principalities and powers. I think many are just a result of life and having these minds of flesh that you and I have. But I will say this, once the worrying starts or the guilt starts or any of those things, I think the enemy of our souls is right there, ready to play the thought game with us, isn't he? And drag us down even further into despair. And he can take you and I from one thought and spiral us down into depression in just a few moments. Let, let me give you an example, and I have no one in particular in mind. It's an exaggeration, but it hopefully will prove to you um, the point that what Satan does, I think you'll probably be able to think of some own, your own scenarios, but that ridiculous spiral of thoughts. Let's say that a month ago you saw the announcement for this conference. Looked good. First thought, wonder who it could go with. 
Normal thought, normal fear. Next thought, who would really want to go with me? Again, see, normal thought. But rather than fight it with the tools we'll be looking at in a minute, you hang on to it, you entertain it, and Satan notices the insecurity. And he sees that insecurity as an uh, invitation to play a game with you. You just had a thought. Now it's his turn. Puts his thought forward. Yeah, I mean, nobody has even asked you to go with them, have they? He already knows what you're going to think, so the rogue that he is, he doesn't even let you take your turn yet. And he shoots another thought at you. You better not risk asking anybody. What if they say no? How humiliating that would be. Remember what happened when you were a kid? You're the same. Nothing has changed about you. Nobody likes you. And you know what? Remember, you have big feet. (laughs) Now, you've always had big feet, and you know it. Who would want to sit in a row at the church with someone that had big feet? And you know what's going to happen. You're going to sit in the row, and somebody's going to want to walk by you. And they're going to trip, and they'll look down and and see your feet, and they're going to smirk. And then their friend's going to go, what happened? And you're going, look at that. And you know that lady's probably thinking, she probably can't get shoes anywhere but go online. (laughs) And so you go through all of these thoughts, and you think, I can't go to the conference. I have big feet. Now, how do you go from, wow, that looks like a great advertisement for a good conference, I wonder who I could go with, to, I can't go to that conference, I need to stay home and watch it online because I have big feet. (laughs) But you and I do that all the time, don't we? And, And if he can get us with that first thought, see, first thought's not our fault. We get arrows shot at us all the time, but when we start dwelling on it, Satan just takes us down that spiral. And I have found that it is much easier to pull myself out when I catch that first thought than I'm when I'm down in that spiral. So I've learned I don't want to play. I, and, but I can't play there's a devil under every bush or there's a devil behind every bad thought. So some are his, Some are yours, and really there's no sense in trying to differentiate them because really we we think very much like him. And the tools to beat those thoughts, the thoughts of the flesh or the thoughts of the enemy, are the very same thoughts. Now, I can guarantee the effectiveness of God's tools for mind battles. Isn't that incredible? God puts in his word ways that we can defeat the things that drag us down in our mind. How can I do that? Because he has promised it. He has guaranteed that they will work. And I'm going to, we're going to put quite a few scriptures up on the slides and um, on the screen. So just write down the reference and, and listen to what I'm saying because these are truths declared by God. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace. Ephesians 6, 11, that you may or will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, 13, that you may or will be able to withstand. Ephesians 6, 16, you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. He shoots us arrows. But we, through the word of God, have this ability to cause them to fizzle out. That's an incredible promise. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. And Philippians 4, 9. And the God of peace will be with you. Incredible promises. And there's more, but for the purposes of today, They'll have to suffice. Now, if you're familiar with any of those verses, you know I didn't give you the whole verse. I gave you the promise part. 
But in each case, in each one of these, it's a conditional promise, a promise based on what you and I do. The fulfillment of the promise is based on our choices. In other words, this peace of mind that's a result of winning the battle of the mind, it's not dependent on God. It's dependent on us. If you and I do what he says in these verses, he will do what he said he would do, give us peace and victory over the attempts of the devil to win the battle of your mind and mind. So here's our part. There's so much here. I'm, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures because there are weapons. This is a scripture-filled message, and my attempt to keep you awake is I'm going to be putting up lots of slides. I don't think I've ever done such a PowerPoint-filled message before, but uh, we need God's word to fight this. Only the application of God's word is going to enable us to be victorious over the battles of our minds, take those things captive. So I'm going to not really hand out your weapons this afternoon. See, the day you accept Jesus Christ, God handed you this arsenal of weapons. Here, this is available to you for peace and victory, for uh, not having fear, for not being discouraged. Here they are, already accessible to us. We're told that he daily loads us with benefits, and, and I, I think he daily gives us the arsenal of the weapons that we need to fight, because he knows what our day is going to be like. So first I want to go with the put-offs, the things that you and I can't do if we want to bid, uh, win the battle of the mind. We've got to put these things away. So number one, we are to put off every thought that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Put away anything that is against what we know God is like, what we know God has declared. Second Corinthians 10.5 in NIV says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. If a thought is against the truth of God, then you and I would be wise not to entertain it, not to go with it. If it doesn't pass through that grid line of Philippians 4, 7, which we'll talk about in a minute, we've got to take that thought captive to Christ. We have to bring it into subjection to Christ. We have to allow him to tell us whether we should con continue thinking that thought or not. Not us deciding, but Lord, should I go with this or not? And we've got to believe him. I remember a few years ago when we had to put my mother in a rest home for a couple of weeks, and we walked by this one door towards her room, and I looked at the room number, and right away I remember that just a year and a half prior to that, that's the room my, my dad went home to be with the Lord in, and, uh, you know, the thoughts. And I remember so clearly, I felt like the Lord said, don't go there. And it was so clear to me, because where would my thoughts have gone? All the sadness, rehearsing in my mind, what it was like for my dad to suffer, all those kinds of things. And it was like, like the Lord just said, do not go there. And see, that's taking our thoughts captive. It's being obedient to him when he says, don't go there. It's like, all right, I won't go there. And I stopped. I have a coffee cup in my office at church. It's a Mary Inglebright cup. And see, she's standing there with her, on her hands on her hips saying, snap out of it. And this is not counsel to give someone else, all right? This is something for you. Uh, but every once in a while, when I get overwhelmed and I'm in my office, I just kind of roll my chair over to the cup and I set it on my desk and I stare at it. You know, it's just, stop it. Don't go there, snap out of it. And see, we are able to do that. Sometimes we think, oh, this is so overwhelming, I, I can't pull myself out of this feeling. But you know, say you're in an argument, a heated argument with someone, and you're angry and you're expressing your anger. Phone rings, what do you do? Hello, hi, 
Yeah, yeah, everything's good, fine. How are you doing? Now, how are you able to do that? See, you have the desire to do it and you're fully capable of snapping out of it. We all are and we've got to remember. It's a whole lot easier to snap out, as I said, when you're right at the first part and you're deeply into it. See, this whole idea of taking thoughts captive is really only available to the believer. What an awesome privilege we have. I mean, an unbeliever can shut their mouth, can prevent outbursts of words, but this battle of the mind, the harmful thoughts, have to be replaced with the truth, the truth of God's word. See, only believers have access to the truth of God's word because it only applies to us. And, and I feel like stopping right there and, and just say, La, you know, think about that privilege that you and I have to deal with our thought life, the truth that God has said and declared to us because we're his girls and we can beat this. And number two, we are to put away short-sightedness. And we get that from 2 Peter 1.9 and we'll look at uh, this again when we look at the put-ons. So number two is to put away short-sightedness. And number three, put away thoughts or worries about tomorrow. Put away thoughts and worries about tomorrow. Matthew 6.34 says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. And let me add to that put-off number four, put away thoughts or regrets about yesterday. Put away thoughts and regrets about yesterday. Philippians 3.13 says, Brethren, Paul wrote, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those which are ahead. And verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So key here. Paul says, I forget the things that are behind, and yet he just, the verses prior, rehearsed his, his past life. But forget here means I will not let these things affect who I am. And this is so crucial, girls, that, that we all have those past messages. And Paul says, I'm not going to let those things dictate who I am. Who I am is what Christ has for me, and I'm pressing forward to that. I'm not going to let the regrets about yesterday get to me or the pride. See, it's when we have regrets, it's, it's our own effort to make ourselves pay, and Jesus took care of that, didn't he? He says we owe nothing. Give him your mistakes so he can do something good with him, with them. Don't hold on to them and limit him. Don't look back. You aren't going that way. And I have this sign in my office because I do a lot of counseling, and it's so helpful. Don't look back. You're not going that way because we're pressing for the things that God has for us in Jesus Christ, and those are all good. And we have to know how good they are if we want to press towards them, right? You ever want to press towards something that you're not excited about? No. But when we're excited about what we're pressing toward, we don't even want to look behind because that just holds us back. And that's where Paul was at. I, I, my past doesn't matter anymore because I just am so excited about what God has for me in Jesus Christ. It's a good place to be. Now I want to look at some put-ons. Those are things we're supposed to put off. We're supposed to put on. I have 10 things. Um, and when I'm done, it'll all be on a list. And, and you, that's why you have cell phones. You can take a picture of the slide, and it'll kind of help you a little bit. Um, first one, put on the knowledge of God and his promises. We just saw that we are to take captive any thought that's against the knowledge of God. So we would be wise to have a knowledge of God, right? 
We read in Deuteronomy 7, 9, therefore know the Lord your God, he's God. The faithful God who keeps covenants or promises and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. No, see, we've got to know this, that the Lord we claim to serve, he is God, that he is faithful, that he is the God that keeps his promises. And we've got to know his promises. I mean, how can you trust him to take all the things in your life and work them out for good unless you know he has promised to do that and that he is a keeper of all of his promises. Not one has failed. Or can you trust him to cover your credit card debt when you lost your job? See, we've got to know the word of God. Has he promised to do that? Has he promised to cover any kind of debt that we might have? Has he promised to get us the jo a job next week when we've lost one this week? We've got to be able to put our promises in the sure promise, our faith in the sure promises of God because they can be depended on. How do we get to know God and his promises? Through what he said about himself and, and what he said he promised through his word. Psalm 42, 11 says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. See, you can't put your hope in someone you don't know. We've, we've got to know him. Andrew Murray wrote that prayer is how God gets a hold of us. He said, he wrote, the word of God is how we get a hold of God. Prayer is how God gets a hold of us. And I like that. So number two is pray. Pray about everything. Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, you see the comma? It's got to be there for grammatical purposes, but... Uh, it's not good for practical purposes because what we tend to do is we say do not be anxious for anything and then we, we kind of leave a gap and we think about all we're not supposed to be anxious about and we, we get ourselves in this state of fretting and take out that can comma and it's do not be anxious about anything but in everything pray. You know, as soon as you catch yourself being anxious, start praying because it is the thing that changes us. Prayer doesn't change God. See, it, it changes us. Psalm 61, 2 says, From the end of the earth, I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now, notice first, this victory over the battle of the mind is, is not that we will never have a battle. We'd like that, but... That's not what we have in life or what scripture has promised. When my heart is overwhelmed, overwhelming things will always be there for us. But when they do, we're to go to him. Philippians 4, 6 gives us another tool for fighting the battle of the mind, that of thanksgiving. So number three is we give thanks. Some verses call it a sacrifice. And Sometimes it is, isn't it? When we're fighting the battle of the mind, Thanksgiving is so hard to do because in those times we tend to be so self-focused and we just don't want to and we don't feel like it. I see it time and time again in churches. People that are fighting a battle very often don't worship. Is he worthy of being worshiped when we're in a battle? Yes. But somehow we, we stop thanking him. We stop being grateful. And the battle becomes overwhelming. But if we push ourselves and give God that sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise, the battle will be lightened. God promises that. Not too long ago, I was in my devotions in, in Psalm 47. And it begins with the words, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. 
And I was tired, and it was a bad day, and I looked at that, and I felt the Lord kind of saying, clap your hands, shout to me. I'm like, Lord, I, I don't, I'm not there, you know, sorry. And uh, kind of went on with my day, and, you know, it was getting a little bit better. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit said again, clap your hands. Can you do it now? And I kind of sighed because I knew it was the Lord. And, you know, as Crystal was sharing about Moses, we can object, but we need to be obedient in the long run. And, and so I did. I, I started clapping my hands and started singing to him. And there's actually an old Maranatha song that uh, has us, that's keyed off of that verse. And I felt my countenance change. But it was obedience. It was a choice of... Okay, Lord, you say in Scripture, Thanksgiving changes people. I don't feel like thanking you now. I just hurt, but I did it. I put on Thanksgiving, and I watched God change me, and I watched myself win the battle of the mind that just felt like this is just going to be a bad day. you know. And it wasn't because I praised. God promises that in Philippians 4, 7. Number four, meditate on good things. Meditate on good things. Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's our criteria. You know, we, we run these things up to the Lord, you know, and, and he very often comes back with, is it good? Is it a lovely thought? Is there virtue in this thought? See, if it, if it doesn't fall into the category of Philippians 4, 8, it's you and I shouldn't be thinking it. And those are the thoughts we say, here, Lord, this is off. This is not going to get me anywhere. Make this your goal. If the thoughts don't fit with these things, commit not to think them, and then choose something to think about that does fit with them. See, there's always the put off, but we can't stop there. We've got to put on something to replace it. we got to do both. If you are seriously trying to do this, this is what you'll probably experience. You have a thought, and you kind of run it by the Lord, and, okay, I know, I know. I shouldn't think this thought. I'm going to put off this thought. I'm not going to think this thought. And the more you say, I'm not going to think this thought, the more you think that thought. And, and so then you decide, okay, praise, praise. I'm going to praise the Lord. That's going to make the thought go away. So you do this, praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus, hallelujah. And then you discover that our minds can actually praise the Lord and think a negative thought at the same time. And it's so frustrating. So this is what I do. I praise the Lord alphabetically because I have to use my mind to do that. I have to concentrate. And I usually choose about three things per letter. And, and I'm not rigid. For example, A might be, Lord, you're all powerful. You are more powerful than this whole problem that I'm going through. Lord, you always love me, no matter what. Lord, you're awesome. And, and when I do it, I try to think of something different each time. Recently, I, I used for B, I said, Lord, you, you heal the brokenhearted. So what I'm saying is, is concentrate on praising him, not whether or not the, the letter is the first letter of a sentence that you think of, do this when you try to go to sleep at night. I have put myself to sleep more times than I can say just by praising the Lord alphabetically. And God inhabits the praises of his people. So we get a better sense of his presence. He responds to praise. And you know what? Satan responds to praise too. He hates it. And he flees when we praise God. Now, he comes back and checks for, as we talked about this morning, a more opportune time. But we fight him back with praise. And so one of the things we need to do to fight that battle of the mind is put on thanksgiving. And then fifthly, be steadfast. 
be steadfast. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 and 58. But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Again, see, our choice. Be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If the enemy thinks you will back down or change your mind, there's a possibility to get you back to thinking the old thoughts. He'll be more persistent. But when I've discovered, what I've discovered, if he realizes how serious you are and how you flee to God so quickly and you praise God so quickly, he backs off. When you're struggling with particular thoughts, make a commitment to the Lord. Be serious. I will not go with these thoughts anymore. I will not entertain them. As I said, you're still going to get the fiery dart shot at you, but it's our choice whether we allow the dart to penetrate or we diffuse it. Number six is the put on to number two of the put offs, which tells us where to put off short sightedness. Second Peter 1 9 says, when we aren't experiencing um, certain things, when we're lacking things like diligence and self control and perseverance, if we're not growing in the Lord, it says we're short-sighted. In other words, we can only see right in front of us. As Crystal said, we, we can only see the spill. Three of our grandchildren have been in Little Lake, and I've taken a lot of photos of them. Now, what tends to happen when you're in the bleachers and you try to take a picture of your grandchild in the field? What do you see? The chain link fence, right? How many pictures do you have of just the chain link fence? And see, that's short sightedness. That's looking at the spill. It's like you can't see anything but what's right in front of us. And Peter says, when we lack these things, when we're not growing in the Lord, it's because we're short sighted. And what do we have to do? We've got to refocus. And when we refocus, what happens is the chain link, what's right in front of us, loses its, its power, and we can see that which we need to see. And so we see a much clearer picture of what's important and what God wants us to see. Golfers have that problem a lot. Sometimes they get stuck in the trees, trees all around them. But good golfers have learned something. They look for the green ahead and they watch for the opening, and they don't look at all the trees that are right in front of them. They look for that opening, and they hit the ball towards that, and that's what God would have you and I do. Ignore the, the things right in front of us that cause us to be short-sighted. Peter tells us that short-sightedness is due to one thing, Second Peter 1, 9, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and what, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sin. See, short-sightedness is often because we forgot. Forgot who we used to be. Forgot who God made, has made us now. We forgot all the glorious things that we get to be now just because of Jesus. And we lose sight. And we start worrying about those things that are right in front of us. So number six is remember God's goodness. The psalmist wrote of having that problem in Psalm 77. He, he used phrases like, my soul refused to be comforted. I was troubled. I complained. And my spirit was overwhelmed. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. You hold my eyelids open. In other words, I can't sleep. We've all been there. And then he goes into this tirade of accusing the Lord of things like, are you going to cast me off forever? Are you going to withhold your mercy? Are you going to fail to keep your promises? Are you forgetting to be gracious? Don't we get like that when we get overwhelmed? We start, it's, it's God's fault. He's left me alone. Truth would 
we can find scripture to combat every single one of those accusations. But you know what? Everything turned around for this psalmist in the psalm as he decided to, instead of despair, start praising. And he said in verses 10 and 11 of Psalm 77, and I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. He forgets. And he started remembering the graciousness and the wonder of God. And you watch this psalm that just said, I complained and accusing God to praising God for his goodness. We've got to counter the lies with the truth. And seven is the counter to putting off short-sightedness, and that's found in Colossians 3.2. Set your minds on things above, not on the things of earth. And speaking of setting our minds, number eight, make God's purposes your purposes. Make God's purposes your purposes. Isaiah 26, three says, you will keep him in perfect peace. See the will? You want perfect peace? Here's a promise here. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now this word mind here can be translated whose purpose, whose purpose of life. See, this is one of my, my life verses here. I hang on to this and I, it's my check when I don't have peace. God promises perfect peace. When? When my mind or my purpose of life is stayed on him, stayed on him. So I lack peace. I check, what's my purpose? Sure enough, what's my purpose? Me. That's why I don't have peace. And I get my purpose on, on the things that God would have for me. And voila, I have peace. What a glorious promise. And see, this is the battle of the mind. I have no peace. I have no peace. Here's your check. Where's my purpose of life? Oh, it's on me. Switch it. And the promise is peace. God's antidote to fear is himself. Over and over again in the Bible, God declares, do not fear I'm with you. If you don't know him to a place where you trust him, there's not much value in that, is there? See, what if you were really fearful and I came up to you and said, you don't need to be afraid. I'm with you. What would you say? What good is that, right? You know, what are you going to be able to do about my problems? And see, if we don't know that God is all-powerful, holy, he does everything perfectly, and loving, then, then how are we going to trust him? How are we going to not fear? But this God that is perfect and all-powerful and loves you says, don't fear, I'm with you. Remember when you were little and called out to your mom sometimes at, at night and you were so afraid? What'd she say? It's okay, mommy's here. It's all you needed to hear because you trusted your mom to take care of you. And, and here our wonderful, awesome God says, don't fear, I am with you. All of his resources available at his disposal, which he promises are for our good. Number nine, put on the armor of God. And we find a listing of each piece in Ephesians 6, 11 to 17. We see truth and we see righteousness and we see the gospel and faith and salvation and the word of God. We are to put them on. We are to apply the truths that they represent. And then we have the promise, if we do this, we will stand. For today, I want to focus just on the first piece of armor for a couple minutes. Satan's first piece of weaponry is what? He's a liar. He tells you lies, and he, and he tells enough um, of the lie to make it make sense to you and to me. And our first line of defense against his attacks is the truth. 
God says, put on truth. That's the armor he has given us in his word. When we start doubting and we start fearing and we start believing accusations against ourselves, wait a minute, what's truth? What does God say? Ask yourself when you're in a mind battle, what am I believing right now? And that's such an important question. When your mind, you become fearful or discouraged, wait a minute, what am I believing right now? And face it. And then, what does God tell me about that? What is truth? And you'll find that it's often a lie that has you in turmoil, not truth. And then 10, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Stop thinking like the world and stop thinking like you. Think spiritually. See, think what God thinks. And, and really, when I say something like that, you pretty much know how God would have you think about a situation. And it's in the choice, isn't it, girls? Will you choose to go with what God thinks or what you think? One night I was watching a football game with my husband, and uh, the runner was, was backing up to catch a, a ball, and, and he got just smacked from behind. And I, I said to Dale, do they ever try to catch a ball again after they've been hit that hard? And he said there's a saying, they call it hearing the sound of the footsteps. And once they've heard them, they often hear them when they're running to catch the ball, and they have to deliberately block them out. Many of you have memories, painful memories of the past, and becoming a new creature in Christ doesn't make them go away. Sometimes we're, we're told that, you know, if you're a new creature in Christ, oh, it's just gone. And yet you still hear those voices, don't you? The thoughts still plague you. See, being a new creature in Christ gives us the power to refuse to give them the power. That's the put off. The put on is we have this power to apply God's truth and refile the messages that the past has given us, power to press on past them towards what God has for us now. You see, much of the torment we suffer in our minds is due to how we have filed the events in our lives or how I would, uh, I'd love to give you a whole message on this because it's so crucial. If you filed an event in your life as a statement about who you are or your worth, you will battle in your mind. If you filed an event in your life as devastating, as ruin, as waste, as debilitating, you will battle in your mind. And it's not until you refile that event as God sees it that you will have the victory and you'll not only prove or discover God's will. See, as Romans 12 says, you'll learn to love God's will and cherish God's will and want it. The battle of the mind, it's a battle and it's your battle to fight. God won't fight it. See, he provides the tools and the power. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. The Romans would actually, you know, pull up their robes so the robes wouldn't hinder them when they would go into battle. And so God says, pull up your robe. Pull up the things that hinder you in your mind and put them away. See, God doesn't wield the sword. You do. God doesn't pull up your robe. You do. God doesn't apply the truth to the lies that have been thrown at you. You do. God supplies the tools. God supplies the promises. And he supplies the guarantee where to use them. And your mind, rather than being a mind-filled, battle-filled, will be a place of, where peace and joy can reign. Now, just a minute, I just want to talk to you about 
uh, this place of understanding that God supplies the tools for you to protect your mind. And we see in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Old thoughts in the past, as I said, often taints our new thoughts. And we, we think, as, as Christians, we will never have to deal with them again. But we haven't been promised that. Yet often what we're taught and the result is we, we doubt ourselves and we feel like somehow we failed because those old thoughts haven't passed away. So this is important. If we're going to have victory in taking our thoughts captive, what has changed since you became a Christian? Holy Spirit's come inside of you, hasn't he? His goal is not just to save us, but to work in us and through us that which comes gives us a desire to do what God would have us do in the power. The Holy Spirit fills, comforts, teaches, empowers, transforms. The action of the Holy Spirit is often used interchangeably as, as the Holy Spirit coming upon, but this filling is a Greek word, pletho, which has a sense of influence supplied by, furnished by. The Bible uses the word fill to describe someone filled with envy or confusion or fear, even a sponge filled with vinegar. So you get the sense of that's a major influence, that's a control. It's not a one-time experience. Filling of the Holy Spirit seems to be a result of you and I choosing who or what will influence us at the time. Choosing to yield to the guidance of the Holy Spirit is crucial if we're going to take our thoughts captive. Every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, but we limit his power. That always amazes me. We have as much of the power of the Holy Spirit as we would like, and it's up to us to obey his promptings or not. When we have a thought that we just shouldn't dwell on, see, our part is to allow him to show us what to think. This taking captive to Christ is we take the thought and he by the Holy Spirit shows us what he sees and then quickens our heart to his truth to replace the thought. We can't fight the thoughts of our minds with our minds. We've got to seek what God says and, and that understanding comes from the Holy Spirit and it's our choice, see, are we going to be filled with him? Are we going to be influenced by him? Or are we going to be influenced with our thoughts or the thoughts of the world? That quickening of the truth comes only by, by the Holy Spirit. So John 14, 26 talks about him, but the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things. That's what we need. See, what am I supposed to be thinking, Lord? And he quickens to us, oh yeah, that verse. In John 16, 13, however, when, the, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you in all truth. And we've got to get out of our heads and listen to what the Holy Spirit says, girls. And when we do and we apply his truth, we'll win, and that's amazing. 